Uh, hello, welcome to the live and the YouTube session for Space Onova in conversation with the Marseille series. We are taking this conversation further and our guest of honor for the day is Dr. Harshad Kulkarni. And I'll allow for you all to settle in and join our live. Please call your connection and your network. This could be any science enthusiast, a person who loves astrobiology, loves geology, biology, or just loves space sciences. You all can join in are very, and are very much welcome in this YouTube live. And we'll start the conversation further in uh, any moment now. I also hope that you are doing good. It's a very beautiful morning today. And uh, those of you who are watching us from India, I hope you are having a very beautiful morning. Everybody just join in and we'll be starting with this conversation. So I hope you have called your connections and we can start now. So hello all, uh, I hope you are doing good. This is the YouTube live session on the Space on Over's official uh, website or YouTube channel. And in conversation uh, with me here, I have Dr. Harshad Kulkarni. And uh, let me introduce to our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Harshad Kulkarni. He has a PhD in civil engineering from Kansas State University, Manhattan. He also has an MS in civil and environmental engineering at Colorado State University and a BE in Environmental Engineering from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. His research interests are in aqueous geochemistry of lava, volcanic caves, trace elements biogeochemistry, dissolved organic matter, groundwater flow, biogeochemical reaction modeling, and advanced water purification and use. He'll be introducing us to the expedition he has done so far in the following field. But before that, let me introduce you guys to our latest expedition that the Space on is carrying from 4th of July to 10th of July at Rajasthan, India. This expedition is called Mars Analog Site Expedition, Mars 2022, and will be held in the following dates in Rajasthan. You all can join the expedition and you're very much welcome. Along with that, I'm very proud to say that Space on also offers two exciting scholarships for the deserved students only at a half cost that is 50 percent cost along with that there is one more scholarship at 100 percent cost you can get all the details at the Marseille website in the spaceonova.com now i welcome dr harshad here and he'll be presenting a very good presentation and giving you his uh, sharing his insights about the uh, expedition he has uh, carried on i welcome you dr harshad and uh, you can start with the presentation all right. Thank you very much, Yamini. Uh, and hi, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, have a, uh, I hope you're having a good day uh, if you are in India. Um, so thanks for introducing me. And uh, I, I really would like to uh, thank uh, Space Onova and all of you for uh, this opportunity to kind of share my experience in lava tubes with you. So kind of I changed my uh, title of the presentation a little bit than what you see on the screen. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about this importance of terrestrial lava tube caves uh, in search of life beyond Earth. And uh, basically terrestrial lava tubes is because we are exploring as of now lava tubes on Earth. Uh, so basically this is something I would like to talk today uh, about. Um, Yamini, Yamini, you already introduced me uh, just to kind of give you a brief uh, kind of a little bit more on what I do. Uh, I'm currently a lecturer in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, and I teach uh, classes like geomicrobiology and biogeochemical modeling, which basically stem from my uh, postdoctoral research and uh, PhD through research. Uh, one other thing you might have noticed is all my education has been in civil environmental engineering and uh, how come I uh, end up doing this earth and planetary science research. Uh, but that's very interesting because uh, uh, my PhD research was based on aqueous geochemistry and that since since then I basically uh, fallen into this lovely field. Um, uh, my research interests or research directions, again, as uh, Yamini briefly mentioned, uh, trace elements, uh, basically because of their health concerns, their mobility and sequestration, so it's biogeochemistry. Uh, 
uh, their applications in desalination, advanced water purification, so slightly engineering. And then very recently, uh, I started doing research uh, in this planetary analog studies. And it's very interesting how you can combine all of these uh, kind of tools and techniques that you have learned through engineering, science, and whichever education branch you are in, uh, you can use it for uh, any of these basic fundamental research, uh, engineering applied research, and some uh, kind of uh, exploratory research like planetary analog studies. So uh, <clears throat> today I'm going to uh, talk about this last research direction, uh, planetary analog studies. Uh, before I move into that, I would like to acknowledge uh, some key uh, personnel here, as well as some of the organizations. So um, majority of this research that I'm going to present was funded by uh, NASA. Uh, so we worked in collaboration with NASA Ames Research Center uh, and basically this project called Braille uh, that I'll talk about. Uh, so this is the logo of that NASA Braille project. Uh, we work with National Park Service here in U.S., and there are several other organizations, uh, Southwest Research Institute uh, here in San Antonio, Desert Research Institute, uh, my university uh, at, at San Antonio, Kansas State University. Uh, we work with some national laboratories, so we will, I will share some of that results with you today as well. So uh, I would also like to acknowledge this personal, Dr. Shogato Datta. He's my postdoc advisor here at UTSA. Uh, Dr. Jen Blank, uh, she's at Blue Mar Marble uh, and NASA Ames. Uh, Diana Northrup at U University of New Mexico, Charity Lander at Swery. And Josh Ford, who was a master's student working with me on this project. Now he's a PhD candidate at Baylor University here in Texas. Um, so caves are indeed very interesting features and uh, this interest is not like very new right so this cave, this first picture here that you see uh, we are seeing this artist's uh, illustration uh, where the neanderthal man's first home natural home was probably the caves right so the caves are not new to us there we, we are not interested in caves very recently it's been very ancient interest right another picture what we are seeing here is a, a largest natural cave in the world uh, in the vietnam and what you are seeing here is people are actually camping there right so it's a huge opening of the cave and people are putting tents there and then they walk into the caves for recreational purpose and so on so Caves are indeed very interesting. Uh, our interest uh, from astrobiology point of view is very particular. Uh, so we ask questions like, do caves host life? Do, they, do the caves have life? Uh, do they host food for life or water? And why do we care about caves in particular? So some of these questions I will try to kind of elaborate um, through my presentation. So there are different types of caves and uh, the first one here is solution cave or limestone cave. Uh, and you, as you know, this is made up of limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And dissolution of this limestone creates these cave features. So this is one type of cave. Uh, we have Pelus caves. Those are basically formed by between the boulders, uh, naturally fallen into random deep. Uh, so these are really small size caves usually. We have some ice caves. Uh, uh, sorry, so, uh, some sea caves. So you can see actually this is a seawater and you have this cave, you can kind of kayak into it. Uh, there are some glacier caves as well. And then we have these caves called primary caves or we call them lava tubes. And the reason we call them primary is because they are formed by volcanic activity, right? So uh, lava caves, volcanic caves, lava tubes, lava tube caves. So those names are quite a quite times uh, interchangeably used. And this is something we are going to focus today in our uh, kind of discussion today. Okay, so uh, in this picture here, what you are seeing is how lava tubes look, look like on earth. So this picture is, a, is an aerial view of uh, this place called Lava Beds National Monument in California. So it's Northern California. And what you are seeing here is this sinuous pit chain. So you can see this kind of linear pit chain, right? So this is basically a opening of this lava tube. So collapsed opening of lava tube, which you see in this picture to the right. So this is one of those openings that we, you see some, some of our colleagues sitting and kind of standing around it. Okay, so many of you probably know how lava tubes are formed, but basically when the lava is flowing, uh, 
the surficial uh, kind of or the surface is in contact with cooler atmosphere which hardens faster and then basically it forms a rock usually it is a basalt and then you have you still have this tunnel from which through which the lava is flowing and once the lava is drained out completely it le leaves behind those lava tubes so that's how the lava tubes are formed and they are pretty common on earth in many places so some of the lava tubes can be in few meters, like one to three meters in diameter. So you can see this picture to the left. Uh, <clears throat> I'm standing here in one of the lava tubes and I'm five feet, seven inches tall and I can probably stand like really well, right? So though some of them are really big and some of them, they are really kind of tiny. So you have to crawl through them. So they have some either smooth or rough surfaces flow on the floor and the wall and ceiling. Uh, and depending upon uh, type of the lava flow that form those caves. Um, and of course, these are caves. So this is dark, right? So these are some of the features of uh, when you go inside a lava tube, you are going to experience. So, so what? We can go in there, uh, but why do we care about it? Right. So, well, it appears that lava tubes are not just present on the Earth, but they have been identified on other uh, rocky planetary bodies such as Earth's moon as well as Mars. So here are some images that were found uh, that were collected through remote sense, remotely sensed images. Um, so this is a collapsed opening of a lunar lava tube. And uh, you can see some of the maps here. So you, you can see the similar sinus pit chains here as well, similarly on the Mars as well, right? So we know that such features exist on Mars as well as the moon. And that's where this Braille project came in the picture. So the Braille stands for Biologic Resource Analog Investigations in Low Light Environments. So that stands for Braille. Right. And this project basically has two teams. One is science team and other is robotics team. I was part of this science team and this project was funded by, as I mentioned, from uh, NASA P-STAR grant. So the science team was responsible for, for studying these lava tubes uh, in terms of their geochemistry, microbiology and biochemistry. And I'll talk more about what I was doing in this particular team as well. And then the idea was to kind of tie that scientific data with the rover. Uh, and basically this unmanned rover can walk into the cave and identify some of these biologically important features that, that can be in future be identified on other planetary bodies. So why are lava tubes important? Because they host uh, rich microbiological diversity. Uh, records of past, it records past life uh, in the form of mineral features. And it, that's why it's a terrestrial analog for other planetary bodies. So you can see some pictures here. So we are inside these caves and you can see the walls of this cave are covered with this golden or green looking mats. Those are actually microbial mats, right? On this top right picture, you have these mineral features uh, though we call them polyps. So basically these are the mineral features or speleothems that are found inside these caves. And of course we do have water inside these lava tubes as well. So basically we have microbes, we have waters and we have some minerals in these caves. Now, if you look into these cave walls uh, to the picture to the left uh, top, you will see the walls are again covered with these different colored microbial mats. Some of them are hydrophobic. You can see water is kind of forming these drops on top of those mats, right? So there are different types, different chemically different, physically different microbial mats there, which are very interesting. Um, <clears throat> when uh, when we look at those mineral features, uh, we we can you can if you see my uh, kind of a marker pane here uh, in the picture. Uh, and then if you zoom into that, you will see these features like those polyps that I showed earlier, right? So studying these features is basically called speleology or it's, it's like a study or exploration of caves. And the speleothems are the mineral features found inside the cave. So we are trying to study all of these features together in order to understand how the caves work. Uh, there are different types of speleothems and you can see in pictures, um, 
uh, they are kind of morphologically different. So you have something called white encrustations. So it's like a like a layer of mineral crust on the wall or ceiling of the cave. You have these polyps. You have cauliflower like looking cauliflower like things uh, or mineral features in the caves. You have encrustation, but it is tan in color. You have finger like polyps and you have this coralloid. So there are many of these morphologies and these names are not uh, universal names, but we basically name them depending upon how they are looking, right? Um, now, <clears throat> now these speleothems uh, are, as I said, they are made up of mineral minerals, right? And by definition, uh, if if you uh, if you have taken geology classes, mineralogy classes, you know that uh, minerals are inorganic in nature, right? So, uh, but the speleothems are not completely inorganic because they also contain some organic matter, some microbial uh, kind of products into them, and that's why we think that the speleothems are considered as biosignatures because they record the uh, kind of signature of biological activity in them, okay? Now, Braille team, uh, we looked at this different uh, morphology of like um, speleothems and what we found very uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, upfront observation was that these different mineral features contain different amounts of uh, DNA in them. So if you look at the look at a particular mineral feature and measure the DNA amount in it, there is a wide range of that, right? But definitely we did find DNA in almost all of these features. And this is, of course, not very surprising, right? Because there is life everywhere on the earth. So it's not very surprising that we find DNA in these features. But what if we can confidently say whether a particular speleothem uh, found in the tube, lava tubes on Earth is formed via either biological process or purely chemical or abiotic process, right? That's very important because if we know, if we can differentiate between biotic and abiotic processes, we can train the robots to identify such features on other planetary bodies when, when we have these future unmanned missions. And many space agencies like NASA here, or even ISRO, <coughs> excuse me, um, or even European Space Agency, they have already identified uh, that their next stop is going to be a lava tube. So it's already been considered very important important that the lava tubes uh, are a good target for our astrobiological target. Okay. So again, just coming back to this Braille project, that's the overall goal of the Braille, Braille project. Okay, now studying the caves on Earth uh, for like searching the life beyond the Earth, right? This is an awesome idea. But as we know, the devil is in the details, right? So we have wonderful ideas, we have terrific plans, but how to actually do it? Right, so it requires a precise geochemical composition uh, of the speleothems. A lot of chemistry is involved in it. Specific microbial metabolism, so a lot of microbiology, genetics, bio biochemistry is involved in it. Water rock microbe interaction, so geology, water chemistry combined together, and calculations and modeling. So a lot of mathematics, engineering, and coding is kind of involved into all of this study, okay? I'm going to focus on a very specific or very small fraction of this entire project. Um, so basically, I want to talk about how these speleotherms are formed or how we think, uh, based on our data, they, they are formed, okay? So our... Of course, the first thing uh, involved was the field work. Um, <clears throat> so when you we went into the caves, collected these different speleothem samples, different water samples. Uh, this is an example of a cave uh, map that you can see. So we are basically scouting that entire uh, kind of cave, identifying where we want to collect the samples, what type of samples, collect the samples. I was particularly interested in how the water and the minerals are interacting together to form some of these speleothems. So the next part uh, was looking at this, uh, some of the speleothem uh, chemistry or geochemistry and the features that I showed you before in the pictures, uh, we collected them uh, and then we analyze them using different techniques. 
And uh, I'm showing here a picture of Josh Ford, who is a PhD candidate now, as I said, but basically his master's thesis, uh, he, he looked at a lot of these pileothem samples and their uh, X-ray diffraction spectra uh, and some X-ray fluorescence as well. So to look at the elemental composition, uh, what is the mineralogical uh, kind of composition of these different features and so on. And what we found was most of these pileothems were made up of opaline silica or calcite, right? So if you know what opal is, it's basically amorphous silica. Right. And calcite is calcium carbonate. So those are the two major uh, kind of components of this, all of these pilothems, but their morphologies are different. And of course, there are some differences in other elemental compositions which are shown in this graph to the right. OK, uh, here is one example, one or two examples, just to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, <clears throat> so these two pictures I'm showing are two different morphologies. One is corallite and other is the mineral crust or a cauliflower, I think. Uh, and then you can see this red line or red spectra is actually uh, X-ray diffraction spectra. So the this little hump to the left indicates the cryptocrystalline silica or that opaline silica peak there. And then we have some of these other sharp peaks. Some of them were calcite and so on, so many other uh, minerals as well. So, but you can see that this particular feature uh, is mainly the amorphous silica or opaline silica. And of course we do have some other elements uh, involved uh, in, in the minor phase uh, of those morphologies. Um, moving further, we also used uh, <clears throat> kind of a thin section analysis of uh, this individual uh, features, and you will see that just in a minute. So one of those polyps that I showed you before, right? So we took one of that polyp and kind of section it, and you can see uh, there is a layers of different kind of colors here, right? Whenever you see a layering of, of any like or differences in color, uh, it it kind of it has a potential microbial metabolism involved because this feature is called uh, microstromatolytic feature. So if you know what stromatolites are, uh, their growth pattern is shown by these rings, right? So basically, this is a microstromatolite. It's a really small section. Right. And we look at the under electron micro probe, uh, different elemental composition in this particular small section. So this red rectangle that you see here, uh, you are seeing the elemental composition to the right for that particular section. And what you see is these different colored bands are actually different minerals there. Right. So if you see this white band here is actually a high silica band. Right. And then you have this one band that is high calcium band. You have one band that is high phosphorus band, one one band that is high magnesium band and so on. Some of them are overlapping and some of them are alternating. Right. So we looked at these different elemental compositions in bulk as well as in like individual thin sections, how those speleothems are formed. And basically this microstromatolytic features and presence of some of the trace elements that are important for uh, biological activities, such as copper, vanadium, sulfur, strontium, and so on, uh, that indicate stores the um, kind of biological uh, origin or biological involvement in, in the formation of these speleothems, okay? Now, we know that these caves have water in them, right? So we wanted to see what is the role of water uh, in formation of these uh, speleothems. And this figure to the right actually kind of illustrates uh, how water may be involved in formation of some of these speleothems. So I show the picture of actual feature uh, on the left and then potential mechanism, how it might have formed. But we wanted to understand that in a little bit more details. So we kind of looked at this water uh, from kind of uh, multiple angles. In this schematics, you will see in the, on the next slide uh, is a, a kind of a illustration of how, a, how water is entering into this volcanic cave, right? So there is a source of meteoric water. There is some water that may be percolating through this top soil and the pumice and uh, all the surface sediments. And then you have this internal evaporation condensation cycle uh, inside the caves as well. So 
we are taking into consideration all of these uh, kind of processes and trying to understand using different uh, different um, kind of methods. So uh, if you know about the isotopes are very useful in uh, identifying the source of the water, uh, which is what we did uh, in this study as well. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> what you see in this graph is uh, stable isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen in water uh, and the, basically this plot is uh, delta 18O versus delta HO, so hydrogen and oxygen isotopes and all of these data points are the water samples that we collected from the caves, they are either from the drip waters or the puddle waters on the cave floor. And um, this is this graph to the right is just to help you understand how to read a stable isotope graph. So the main point here is if your points are plotting away from this solid line, that means the water is evaporated. And if those points are plotting on this line, that means the water's, water is not evaporated. What that means in reality is if you have a rainwater in this region, it goes directly into the cave without any chance of evaporation on the surface. In that case, the point will plot on this solid line, right? If the water stays on the surface for longer time, it will evaporate more and then enter into the cave, which is what you will see in this kind of a blue line at an angle to that solid line, okay? So we know that the meteoric water uh, or rainwater or snow melt water with low to moderate evaporation is the source of the water that we see in the volcanic caves that we are studying. Okay. Now we know the source of water. We also wanted to look at the chemistry of this water. So we did this comprehensive chemical analysis of the cave water and you see this table uh, here and I don't want you to go into all of those numbers but what I want you to focus on on those red arrows so you can see the most uh, important element or, or the element with the highest concentration was silica right then also I point out that bicarbonate is the major anion like negatively charged ion we have really high concentration of dissolved organic carbon and we do have some trace elements concentrations present in the waters as well, right? What does all this mean? That me this means that the silica is coming from the weathering of basalt, which is basically the host rock that is forming these rocks. The bicarbonates are coming from the carbon dioxide dissolution and maybe some microbial decomposition on the surface. The dissolved organic carbon uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that, but basically it is being accumulated in the cave water. It is not being utilized in the cave water. And the trace elements may be coming from the host rock itself via potentially the microbial activities. Okay, uh, we, we basically present this data in this particular kind of a canvas. Uh, so we take a ratio of calcium to sodium, magnesium to sodium, and then you can basically put all your points into these different boxes. And basically this confirms that silicate weathering is a primary process that controls the observed cave water chemistry, right? So now does this water contain sufficient concentration of silica and calcium required for precipitation of speleothems? That was the question. Because if you remember, the majority of the uh, majority speleothems contain amorphous silica and some calcite in them, right? Now, water also contains high silica and some calcium, right? So does that mean the water is causing the precipitation of those speleotherms or not is the question. And we wanted to find that out. So we use this technique called uh, inverse modeling or inverse reaction modeling, okay? And you will see that in a bit. Uh, what we do here is you start with the source water, which is just the rainwater without any chemistry in it, without 
the, all the concentrations are really, really low. And then you react that water with the known minerals of like say volcanic terrain, right? So albite, feldspar or quartz, those are commonly found minerals in that basalt. So you react that water with these minerals and these are just examples, but we have more of them. And then you know the major cave water chemistry, right? So basically you know what is the starting point you know what that water is reacting with and you know what that final water chemistry is. Now, in this reaction, there has to be dissolution of these certain minerals and precipitation of certain minerals as well, which are called secondary minerals. And basically in our case, those are amorphous silica. So amorphous silica or chalcedony or calcite or dolomite, those are the possible minerals that could form as a secondary precipitation. Um, so what we found the, the, uh, during this model is that if you have the starting water and the reaction and the known water chemistry, uh, we see that the precipitation of these minerals is impossible. So it is thermodynamically not possible to precipitate any of those minerals. That means there has to be some external force that is causing the precipitation of those minerals. And we knew that in the caves, we have this evaporation condensation cycle happening. So evaporation of water can actually precipitate some of those minerals. And I'll show you in a bit how that works. Uh, we use this program called Freak C. Uh, it's a very powerful tool for modeling the water quality for this purpose. Now, that's the, uh, the evaporation idea was tested using uh, this forward reaction model. And this is pretty simple. What you do is take a, a liter of cave water and evaporate it, right? What happens when you evaporate the water? The, the solutes or the ions present in the water are going to concentrate. And at one point they are going to precipitate out, right? That's, what, that's how you get your salt from the seawater. Right. So basically in this graph, what you are seeing is the evaporation factor on the X axis and on Y axis, you have the concentration of these different minerals and the dissolved ions. So you can see as you evaporate the water, you start precipitating amorphous silica and calcite. And we did that for every single water sample that we collected from these different caves. And this research showed that if a particular cave water sample is evaporated, then it can precipitate amorphous silica or calcite depending upon its chemical composition. So we know that evaporation of water is an important process in uh, precipitation of these um, speleothems, right? So that's one part we kind of answered that evaporation of water is very important and it is important for even other rocky planetary bodies because it identifies the presence of water at the time of this at the time of formation of those speleothems. Now I mentioned about this really high concentration of organic carbon in the water, right? Uh, I put this reaction here and if many of you may remember this is simple acetate to bicarbonate reaction, half reaction, right? So oxidation of acetate into bicarbonate is a cellular respiration reaction, opposite of uh, photosynthesis, right? So if when you plot the total dissolved carbon, which includes both organic and inorganic versus dissolved organic carbon only, and all your points plot to this one-to-one -one line, that means we have more autotrophy compared to heterotrophy. Autotrophy means the inorganic carbon is fixed into organic carbon, such as green plants or green algae, right? Or there are many other autotrophic mechanisms as well, right? So, but we uh, we do have a kind of prevalence of this autotrophy in, the, in these caves as compared to heterotrophy. And that is why we have accumulation of this organic carbon, which is otherwise consumed as a food by microbes in the caves. So we know that the microbes in the caves are mainly autotrophic. That means they are generating uh, organic carbon rather than eating it, right? So uh, further, when you investigate more, you will see that this is more of a chemolithoautotrophy. That means these microbes are getting their nutrients from the rocks 
and they are basically generating this biomass or organic matter uh, present or they are not utilizing the organic matter that is present in the cave. So that was kind of another indication of how microbes or what type of microbial metabolism is prevalent uh, in these caves. Okay, so kind of summarizing all of this, uh, this is something we published very recently in chemical geology. Uh, and this kind of, you can see this graphical abstract is kind of now we have added some more information there. Uh, but basically what does this mean in the context of our original hypothesis about formation of speleothems, right? So now if such speleothems are found on other planetary bodies, it definitely confirms that water is an essential ingredient in formation of the speleothems via processes like evaporation and microbial processes may have been involved in the formation of this uh, lunar or Martian, uh, Martian lava cave speleothems as well. Uh, if we find uh, these uh, trace elements or kind of organic carbon uh, kind of compounds uh, enrichment there. So that's kind of uh, our understanding so far uh, based on this kind of geochemistry of our aqueous geochemistry of these lava caves. Uh, the study, uh, although it has a, a kind of application towards astrobiology, it's not just about the astrobiology, right? It's, it's not only about finding life beyond the earth, but it's much more about understanding our own mother earth as well, right? Because more we understand uh, how 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 these different ecosystems function on Earth? It's more better chance for us to find life or even kind of work with the life that we we will eventually find somewhere uh, beyond Earth. So uh, in this study, scientific and ethical research, this type of study, scientific and ethical research is very essential. Uh, Braille's research in caves supports the conservation efforts for all of these cave ecosystems that we work with. Uh, so Lava Beds National Monument is a National Park Service managed uh, field as well. Um, for future researchers opportunities, uh, and I was going through some of the previous lectures or previous seminars that, that Spesonova had, and there are plenty of opportunities, right? In India, like Deccan uh, Volcanic Province, uh, particularly where I am from actually, Maharashtra, uh, we do have some of these lava tubes there as well, which needs to be further investigated. There are some studies already coming up with that. And of course, there are some other analog sites, right? So there are at least these three other craters or impact craters in India uh, that uh, in a way resemble to this Jezero crater. Uh, I heard a talk about that as well. And it, it's very kind of, uh, interesting topic of research as well. And of course, as uh, Yamini uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, many of you may be going to this Sambar Lake, right? So these hypersaline lakes are kind of a hotspot or like living laboratories for astrobiology type of studies, uh, because basically you're looking for life in the extreme environments, whether it is under dark conditions or hypersaline conditions or high altitude conditions, uh, it all basically contributes to this science of astrobiology. So with this, I would like to once again acknowledge my Braille team and thank you and open up for questions. And before I stop, I'm going to just leave you with this one uh, kind of small video. Uh, I hope you can probably see this. Um, <clears throat> But basically, we'll stop here. Uh, this is a robot uh, that Braille team put together. Uh, and basically, this is an unmanned robot um, that is going into the caves and kind of trying to identify some of these biological signatures uh, or the speleothems in the caves. So with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm all, all yours for the questions. Thank you so much, sir. It's, it was a wonderful presentation and we really enjoyed uh, And I hope all of those who are watching us live, they would have also enjoyed it uh, as much as I had. So we do have uh, several questions here. Sure. And I think this, uh, yeah, this person called Rahul, he has questioned that, uh, who is your target audience? And second, he has also, uh, is also asked to you about that, how can we connect life on other planets based on the study of caves on Earth? So I think you have already answered it because uh, like, you know, where, are, where there are lava tubes, we'll find water. But I, I really want your take on this. So can you explain this? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so this is a uh, so the target audience is this is a pretty new science, right? I mean, this needs to go on for everybody at like right from the school children all the way to who who are actually in the uh, science field or robotics or even like uh, other areas like even uh, humanities, for example, right? Basically, people are already talking about habitating the lava tubes in future, right? So definitely the humanities are going to be concerned there as well. Uh, so that's about the audience. I mean, the audience is usually wide. Uh, I did talk about some of the very specific chemistry stuff uh, related to the science as well, but I tried to kind of make it simple as much as I could. Uh, and I, I will do so in many of the other questions in terms of answering them as well. Uh, but definitely finding life on other planets, that's again open-ended question. We do not have any samples to work with from Mars other than some of the meteorites probably uh, that are likely to have come from Mars. Uh, we do have some samples for moon where we don't have the clear evidence of life. So it's, it's uh, and we do have some rovers on Mars uh, as well, right? So we are looking for, uh, you might have seen the pictures of the rocks that they are collecting or the drills you are collecting. So those are the things. So one main idea of looking for lava tubes is that on Mars, for example, the surface conditions are very harsh. You have radiations, you have this harsh, like other harmful, like the desiccating conditions. So the idea is that if at all the life is present or was present on these planets, it is likely to be present or sheltered by these lava tubes or place like subsurface places like that. And that's why lava tubes are kind of potential target for uh, for search of life uh, on other planets. I hope that answers your question, uh, Rahul. Very true, sir. Yes, indeed. Uh, and the uh, uh, second question is again by the same person. So he he's asking that if rovers are used to study the cave, sometimes unusual depth on the Earth's surface, how is the connectivity established with main computer? Yeah, that's a great question. And so far, we don't have... Uh, uh, basically, all of these rovers are right now controlled by a computer uh, that is basically kind of situated at the entrance of the cave. And then basically rover is kind of uh, going, uh, uh, continuing. So definitely there are some technological challenges that are associated with it. Uh, but yeah, so this is like really the starting phase. We still don't know if we are going to send the rover inside the cave on other planet, for example, Mars, because you really don't know what to expect. But on the other hand, there is a, uh, uh, basically it is expected that the lava tubes on Mars will be really huge compared to Earth because of the lower gravity of Mars. So the caves are supposed to be really, really big on Mars. And that's one of the reasons people are targeting lava tubes as uh, the candidate for the analog sites. Nice. Uh, another question we have here is it's from Anuj. And he's asking that how caves can provide the habitable condition for microbial activity on lunar and Mars. Right. So uh, I think I kind of partly answered that question, but uh, basically the surface conditions on the Mars uh, or, or, or Moon uh, are basically we have we don't have very, we have a very thin atmosphere or literally no atmosphere. Uh, so you have direct kind of bombardment of these um, radiations and uh, <clears throat> desiccating conditions as well. So for life, we need some water and kind of hospitable conditions that and this is about the life that we know about, right? So we are all, all of this, we are talking about the life that we know on Earth, if that is present on Mars or Moon. So if the caves are present uh, on these planets, they provide a constant temperature, constant kind of um, a stable condition or stable atmospheric conditions uh, compared to the surface. And of course, shelter from these uh, radiation. So uh, the stable conditions is one of the main reasons why uh, you would expect if there was or there is life that may be protected or preserved uh, in that form of either these biosignatures or speleotherms or the actual, uh, if you find act your actual microbial life, that would be great. But if not, at least the speleotherms that recorded the past life on those planets. True. 
and uh, Rahul is uh, saying thanks to you. His questions have been answered. I, I do myself have some questions. So uh, sure. since you mentioned about uh, Deccan lava tubes, and I know about serpentine lava tubes in India. So can they act as potential analog sites for Moon or Mars, as you also told that? Right. So uh, uh, did you mention iron oxides? No, Deccan lava tubes in serpentine uh, volcanic caves. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, any lava tube, if you think about the feature itself, it's a physical feature, right? Now, what what uh, what really controls is what type of nutrients you can uh, dissolve into these waters. Uh, depend, and that depends upon some of the local geochemistry of the rocks, like what type of rocks you have or what type of lava flows you had, uh, what is the composition of lava tubes and so on. So, but definitely as long as you have these stable conditions that the caves can provide, uh, that can serve as the, uh, serve as the um, analog site or kind of, uh, yeah, similar to lava tubes. Nice. And so, uh, like, uh, what is the necessary equipments you think we should have on such expeditions, especially if you are talking about geological expeditions? Right. So, uh, I mean, when we did this expedition, we did have some uh, handheld equipment. So people use the handheld Raman spectrometer a lot uh, look for looking at some of the mineralogy. Uh, handheld X-ray X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy uh, unit that is, that comes very handy. Uh, most of the work that we did uh, was collecting the samples from the caves, bringing it back to the lab, uh, and uh, analyzing them. So it really depends upon what question you are trying to answer. Uh, but definitely, there are some uh, kind of handy tools that geologists can carry. Uh, and but definitely, the sampling tools are very important because. Uh, there are two aspects of you. you do not want to contaminate the caves when you go in there so you have to be really using sterile equipment for especially for microbial sample and another reason is basically your analysis should not be impacted by any contamination so uh, when you are entering the cave you really respect the cave and uh, basically sampling as much as you need but definitely not you are basically taking a chunk of speleothems with you just because you can uh, so that's something we followed uh, when we did this field trip. Uh, we did have the permit to collect the samples. Uh, so uh, we, of course, followed the rules and regulations by the National Park Service, how much we can collect and so on. Uh, but yeah, and from geologist's, geologist's point of view, uh, looking at the uh, kind of uh, rock composition or mineral composition. Uh, so if you have X-ray fluorescence, Raman spectrometer, uh, those are the ones I could think of other than like the tools that you need to collect the samples. Yeah, other than the basic tools, torch, light, and everything you need. Right. right. And uh, so since you mentioned that uh, there are some lava tubes and lava caves which are very much, you know, a narrow and you have to really bend down to go inside them. And uh, so I uh, know that it requires a lot of precautions uh, beforehand while we are going for an expedition. So can you like tell some of the things that we should have in our mind while going for any expedition in general? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> I mean, uh, think whenever you are going, say particularly in the caves, if you are going, uh, you we don't we are not usually used to any dark conditions, right? So we are never in absolute dark or zero light condition. Uh, in caves, you get that, right? So your eyes need to adapt to these zero light conditions. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, so. Uh, number one the risk, I would say. And the second thing is you are going into a volcanic cave that is made up of basalt, right? So it's a really hard rock. So tripping, falling are the common injuries or common uh, kind of risks involved. So you need to wear uh, kind of the cave like gears, um, helmet and so on, like the gloves, knee pads, elbow pads, all of those things. Uh, definitely you take care of those things. And then uh, on top of that, it's not only you entering the cave, you're not going there for a recreational purpose, right? So at the same, while you are making sure of your safety, you need to be aware of what features you're looking for, right? What scientific questions you want to, un uh, what you want to answer. So for example, just to give you an idea, all of these water samples analysis that I showed you, 
to collect one of that drip water sample, it took me four to six hours, right? Because it's really a slow dripping uh, cave. Like you don't have a lot of water like you have in limestone caves. So it's really slow dripping water. But you really need to collect, keep your hands steady without touching the ceiling. You need to collect that water. So it takes a long time. So patience is another, I think, important virtue that I would say is very important in these type of studies. Whether you go in the caves or any other analog sites, keep your eyes open, uh, keep your scientific temperament open, right? So you need to be always thinking about your research question and try to see what you find how does it relate to your research question and so on? So does that answer your question? Hmm? True, very well, sir. Very Good. well. Okay. All right. uh, we have another question here that how remote sensing plays a role for finding these lava tubes on other planets and how we can understand its origin, maybe what type of lava, like acidic or basic lava. Right, yeah. So there are uh, many studies ongoing uh, and I'm not like the best person to talk about volcanology of other planets. Uh, but I do know uh, from some of my colleagues, uh, uh, the first qu first part of your question is uh, how remote sensing uh, is helpful. So uh, I showed some of those images, right? Uh, and you can see those are taken from the orbiter, actually. Uh, and you can see these collapsed openings or the chain of those pits and so on. And we know that because we have similar features on the Earth, right? So you could see that that Lava Beds National Monument, you have... Uh, the sinus pit chain, which is very, very similar looking to the one on the Mars or one on the moon. So that's how we know about these features ex being exist uh, like existing on them. And there are other features like those collapsed openings and so on uh, that you can, there is a certain geometry associated with that, which can be analyzed as well. So that's the remote sensing part of it. And the other question, uh, I think the, the volcanology uh, of, of like the type of lava and so on, uh, honestly, we don't have sample to work with yet, but we know that the Mars uh, kind of the crust is made up of basalt as well. So it's very similar to uh, how the earth is made up of, like the continental crust of the earth is made up of. Uh, we know that we do know about the moon a lot more as well, but definitely there are some uh, modeling activities that are going on or experimental work that is going on in the lab to simulate the lava composition on these other planets as well. So that that's, I think, as far as, as far I would stretch it uh, because I'm not kind of the volcanologist, but uh, that, that's how much I know from uh, learning from the colleagues, if that answers your question. Yes, uh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> This was the end of our question and answer se uh, session. I don't think so. We have any more questions here. So, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Harsha, that was a very good presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it, as I said earlier, and I really hope our uh, viewers have also enjoyed it. Uh, now, I'll pitch in our very, uh, like, our upcoming and the one of its kind expedition we are taking. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, we are taking part in uh, it's uh, called the Mars Analog Site Expedition. It is starting from 4th of July to 10th of July in Rajasthan, India, where we will be studying the hyposaline environment of Samba Lake. And I welcome all of the students, professionals or any space enthusiasts who just want to learn about astrobiology, origin of life, or maybe just about the analog sites on Earth. So this is your opportunity. Uh, you just have to register in and uh, confirm your seats. This is the link, spaceonova.com. We will also post that in the comment section register yourself and we do have three fantastic scholarships for you two by space Nova and one in collaboration with asa where we'll be getting 100 percent scholarship for attending Marseille. so i hope you all register for this and uh, it was a wonderful session uh, by dr harshad kulkarni thank you so much for uh, you know for being here with us it was a wonderful uh, presentation and uh, we really uh, got some insights about the lava tubes volcanic caves and uh, how they uh, you know they affect uh, or they are important to study uh, for studying astrobiology and uh, rahul has also questioned the same thing yes thank, thank you so much amini and uh, wish you all the best for the field trip i wish i could join as well but uh, but yeah wish you all the best and i hope you enjoy the field trip. we really uh, you know would uh, love if you could join us but Thank you so much.
Sure. So, all right. This was Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Same, sir.